Oh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, talk about this today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the merging, the merging of two passions of mine. Uh, uh, obviously, one is technology and programming, but also this passion of mine that, that has come up within the last five years or so of uh, uh, Japanese art, and in particular, uh, Japanese woodblock printing. And I've been looking for ways to be able to use you know, the skills that I have uh, as a developer to improve uh, uh, this particular uh, medium. So just, I'm going to give like, uh, like a two-second crash course on what Japanese woodblock printing is so that you're, you're aware. So it's this art form that was uh, uh, created in Japan it, during, from about you know, the 1600s to the uh, uh, late 1800s. And this is probably the most famous woodblock print that I'm sure most of you have probably seen somewhere. It's on like mugs and you know, mouse pads and t-shirts. And uh, uh, this is uh, Hokusai's The Great Wave. Um, it's rather ubiquitous. There are a lot of other woodblock prints uh, created during this time period. Uh, uh, prints depicting uh, uh, different people who lived in the city of Edo, which we now know as Tokyo. And it, Tokyo was a major uh, metropolis. At one point, I think in the 1720s, it was the largest city in the world. Um, over a million people lived there. And you have all sorts of really interesting dynamics that come up relating to sort of, let's say, popular consumerism. So this is, uh, these are a lot, a lot of these prints were created and they were mass produced. Uh, um, you know, they're you know, carved in a piece of wood, a piece of you know, ink was put on, a piece of paper was put on, and uh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of these were produced for people to look at and buy and display in their homes. So for example, this particular print here is a depiction of a kabuki actor. Um, at the time, kabuki was one of the most popular forms of entertainment, um, and everyone knew who these actors were. I, I, it's hard for me to draw a parallel to modern day, but like acquiring one of these would be somewhere equivalent to like owning like a poster of Brad Pitt. Um, so like this is like, again, it's like very populist type stuff. Um, everyone knew everything about them. So there are just all sorts of, I think, just fascinating imagery. I don't have any time to talk about it. If you're interested, let me know, and I'll point you to some great resources. Um, so you, there's even depictions uh, going back and looking at uh, like old uh, uh, stories of warriors, some of them pulling from old Chinese tales. And you even have like amazing depictions of the, the, this particular print of, of uh, uh, tattoos. And uh, that's one, uh, one thing that's uh, uh, very common. And, and even today, many tattoos that, the, that you see are sort of, uh, as a Japanese uh, uh, inspired tattoos, are, are actually inspired by Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, you even have depictions of uh, uh, sumo wrestlers, of nature, so you, you, you have fish and plants and trees and everything you can possibly imagine. I just want to show a couple of crazy examples that sort of get you excited so you want to learn more at some point. Uh, this here is a, a Japanese woodblock print. And if you look, it's, you can actually see it's, it's cats, all right? So you have about seven cats here, uh, and they look uh, uh, kind of funny, I would say. So like they're actually, uh, uh, you, you can see their faces. They, they, they look cat-like, but the faces, they're very distinct. And the, what, what this is, is these are actually uh, uh, people being depicted as cats. And these are actually kabuki actors being depicted as, as cats. Now, the reason why this print exists is that this was created in the 1840s, and at this particular time, uh, the government actually forbid the production of kabuki prints completely. So one of the ways around this was to make a print that had cats in it who just so happened to look a lot like kabuki actors. So to the thing is to, to lay people who knew these actors uh, you could look, they could look at them and be like, oh, that looks a lot like uh, Ichikawa Danjuro. But then, like, you know, and it, it was almost a fun game at that point, trying to figure out who was being shown here. But at the same time, this got around the censorship and the government uh, that, was, that was being imposed. Um, so this is another print I wanted to show. Uh, so I just want to zoom in a little bit here. So you see, this, there's a face here 
uh, a man's head. And you see, the man's head is actually, if you look closely, is made up of bodies. It's people's bodies layered in here. And if we zoom in a little bit more, uh, uh, in the top right, there's, there's a, a, an entity up in the top right here, and it, it's actually a catfish who is, looks like is shooting lasers uh, uh, at this particular head body imagery. So again, there, there's a lot to unpack here. But what this is actually is, is this is a depiction of an earthquake. Now, the reason why we know this is that uh, uh, this is another case where during uh, Japan at this time, you weren't allowed to depict uh, uh, current events at all. So an earthquake is obviously a pretty big current event. And in fact, this is a, a, a very large earthquake where a lot of people uh, died. So what's actually being shown here is in the head are the people who died in the earthquake. On the kimono are actually pieces of wood and building supplies. And this is from the rebuilding of uh, uh, Tokyo after the earthquake. And the catfish is actually a depiction of the earthquake itself. Uh, a catfish was common, commonly associated with earthquakes. Um, but I, I love this. It's so much fun for me to like learn about this and sort of unpack it all. And so it, it, for me personally, I see this stuff and I'm like, wow, I really I want to learn more about them, but I also I would love to own some of them. Um, so this is a case now where you can, you can easily acquire uh, Japanese woodblock prints uh, uh, online through dealers or auction houses or wherever. And I just wanted to show you an example. So this is a particular lot of prints at an auction online. Uh, uh, it's labeled as 20 Japanese woodblock prints each depicting a female geisha figure with calligraphy throughout each print. Uh, estimate $400, $600. Now, $20 per print sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's like a pretty good deal. Um, but the thing here is that in this particular auction listing, this auction house has no idea what these prints are. Uh, they've correctly guessed that it's Japanese, so that's good. Uh, but they have no idea what's being depicted, what's written on the prints, who created them, when it was created, anything like that. And this is actually incredibly common. Um, for most Westerners, and I would say most people in general, it, the imagery and the writing on these prints are rather inscrutable. And so one of the solutions is obviously to learn a lot. And this is one thing that I've been doing. So these are some photos from my grossly overflowing bookshelves of all about, all these books are about Japanese culture, Japanese prints, imagery, and I've spent many years now just reading and reading and reading. One of the problems is, is that this is, one, very, very time consuming, um, and it's going to, so I, I realize that this is something that through this alone, it's going to take me years, if, de if not decades, to get really, really good at. And also, it's really expensive. Um, there's a lot of these books are really rare, really hard to find, um, and they're just, it, it's, it's intimidating. Another issue is that you have to learn how to read Japanese. Um, this is something I'm working on. However, you need to learn to read Japanese as it was written from the 17th and 19th century. This is not something that you're going to learn by, by picking up Rosetta Stone. All right, so like this is the sort of thing that you go and do a doctorate to study, and then you get kind of good at, and then you can like read some poetry and stuff. But like, like that's it. Like, like, like this is not the sort of thing that a lay person can easily get into. On top of all this, you need to be able to learn to read Japanese calligraphy, um, and that's a whole other thing. So I, I just I don't have time for that. All right, I don't have time for any of this. So that's why I ended up building this particular uh, uh, resource. So it's called ukiyo-e.org, and ukiyo-e is the name of, uh, it, it's, it's what uh, Japanese woodblock printing during this time period is called. So I created this site, and it's uh, 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 available now uh, uh, online, and on it is a collection of Japanese woodblock prints that I've aggregated from a number of different uh, uh, museums, universities, um, dealers, auction houses, all over the world into a single resource. Currently have about a, a quarter million prints being displayed on here. Um, additionally, I index all the text. Um, I, I, I use a, a elastic search, stick all the text in from all the sources. And so for, exa for example, if you love cats, you can go search for cat and find all the prints showing cats, uh, which is 
there, there are a lot of really cute prints of cats. Um, additionally, I've actually gone through and wherever possible translated the contents of these entries. So like a lot of these entries are from institutions that are Japanese or English. And what I've actually got, done is gone through and translated the Japanese entries into English and the English Japan, uh, entries into Japanese. So the uh, end result is a website that's available both in English and Japanese, which I'm particularly proud of considering I don't really sufficiently read or speak Japanese yet. Um, so this is something that, that's been picking up, and I've been, uh, w what I really wanted to talk about today were all these sort of tools that I've been developing uh, in the process of building this project that will hopefully be of use uh, 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 to you. Like, and for example, one of them is this tool that I wrote. It's a, it's a module, primarily, it's a node module, primarily used with uh, Express for doing uh, internationalization, uh, doing string translation. Um, so for example, you can set it so that if someone accesses, uh, uh, oops, accesses your website from a certain subdomain, in my case, ja.ukiwa.org, you can get the Japanese version of the website with all the strings translated to the correct form. Um, so this is something that interests you that's up on uh, both GitHub and NPM. So the general structure of the website it looks something like this, in that the, I, I use Node to completely power the back end. Uh, I, still, I store most of the data both in uh, uh, MongoDB and the search data in, in Elasticsearch. And I offload all the sort of static asset, uh, assets off onto a CDN as was uh, uh, talked about earlier, because really that's going to be the fastest way to load all this content. The, the users to the site are actually incredibly diverse. Right now, uh, uh, the U.S. is actually the third largest audience. Right now, it, Japan, it goes uh, Japan, then Europe, then the U.S. Uh, as far as popularity. So, it, like, I can't really optimize for, like, making sure it loads fast you know, from New York or San Francisco or wherever, I have to make sure this is going to load really fast around the globe. So for this, I'm using, at the moment, I'm using Amazon CloudFront, and I'm serving all these files, uh, 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 you know, on, on a CDN, wherever uh, the user is. Um, so another thing that I do on the site is I have uh, these listings showing, you see there on the bottom, these are uh, representative prints for particular artists. And one of the things you can actually do is go and look at a, a, a particular user and, or sorry, a particular artist, and when you, oops, um, let's see if I can start this. Um, there's an animation, let's see here. Uh, no, okay. Um, hmm. I don't know. Is it animating? I can't tell. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. So, sorry. So, so what you can do is you can actually move your mouse uh, and scrub through all the images, or not all, a, a, a selection of prints that that particular artist has designed. Um, I'll just do that again. Because like one of the things that I've found is, is tricky is getting to really, an artist potentially, in this case, this particular artist has made 16,000 prints. It's kind of hard to really understand like what the full scope of an artist's uh, uh, work is. So again, so I made this so that that way you can just quickly uh, uh, scrub through and be like, oh, okay, I can kind of see this person's making a lot of like nature imagery, landscapes, uh, things of that color, and they all have this particular color scheme. You can get a, a quick sense. I released this as a jQuery uh, plugin, and you can uh, find that up on my GitHub. So one of the major issues here, though, is finding ways of collecting lots and lots of woodblock print data. Um, this is really hard, and actually goes in really well with the talk earlier, uh, 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 talking about collect, you know, uh, interacting with uh, uh, the, you know, the camping websites, because th there are very, very similar problems here, and I actually tackled it in a very similar way, which is to do the crawling using uh, Phantom JS, because um, one of the issues that kind of comes up in a lot of these websites, so the, again, these museums, universities, uh, uh, wherever, is that a lot of these websites are made very, very poorly. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, it's this is like like a lot of these um, sites seem to have been made back when like 
people were like, oh, the internet super highway. Let's make a website. That sounds like fun. And then it's like, and then it does 20 years later, the site's still there. And then, um, but it's great because, well, I mean, the thing is that a lot of these sites, it's the only way to get these images. So you kind of have to deal with it. Um, so I created a, a particular framework which is very, very flexible and is designed to be able to easily scrape data and images off of like search results uh, 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 from a particular site. So in this way, what, what it's able to do is it behaves like a normal user. It can go, it can perform a search, click through a result, view the result, download the images and data, go back and keep clicking through and going back and, and collecting all the data off the website. Um, so in this way, it ends up being very, very flexible and it's, I, it ends up with this sort of crazy snake-like chain of processing that all the data goes through, where I end up using you know, Phantom GS to do the, the navigation. I'm saving the data. I'm processing it, turning the XML files. I store the data into uh, uh, MongoDB. I process the data even more, turn it into records. So I have like artist records and images, and then correct the information when it's all done. Uh, so this, you know, it ends up being a lot, a lot of work, and this is the sort of stuff I've been spending a considerable amount of time on. So I just wanted to give you an example here. This is a, an actual script. This is one of the, th this is the, the code uh, that is used to, um, uh, uh, in this case, scrape uh, what my per uh, the personal UQA website. The reason why I made this was to be able to test it and just so I could scrape my own website and verify that it was working correctly. Uh, hopefully my website was going to be down during the testing. Um, but the, uh, so you can see here that the, the full logic for scraping the entire website is only about seven lines. Um, and most of that is just the XPath uh, selectors. Uh, just to give an example of some of the data that kind of comes out of a page. Um, so this is like a full dump of the, the, the JSON that comes out of, in this case, a particular artist entry um, that I scraped. Um, all this is up online. Uh, so I, right now, I, I, I'm, I'm very bad at naming things. At the moment, I'm calling it Stack Scraper. Uh, but if this is something that you're interested in, um, the, the full framework for all this scraping is up on there using PhantomJS. And all the individual scrapers I've written for scraping the individual websites are up there as well, uh, up on my GitHub. Now, one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I built this website is that I was really interested in uh, uh, using some of the things that computers are just really, really good at that, that humans aren't very capable of. In this case, one of the things I was really interested in doing was finding ways of doing image similarity searching. So what this is, uh, and, and what I'm, I'm using, at the moment I'm using one particular technology created by this company called Tinai called Match Engine. And I've written a node module for interacting with their API. But what it's capable of doing is that if you have a print, it's able to find the same print in every single institution that has it. So in this case, because since they're prints, there are multiples of them. They're, they're, you know, they're produced in the hundreds, if not thousands. And so any single print, there may be multiple copies around the world. So there might be one in the British Museum, here are the Met in New York, over in Japan. And so what this is able to do is it, it's able to completely ignore all the sort of metadata that might be associated with the image, which is frequently wrong. And instead, able to just look at the images and see that these two are in fact similar. And so as re and be able to return the results and say like, hey, these all look really, really similar. They're probably the same thing. A cool part about this particular te technology is that it's able to even it's even able to do stuff like uh, you can see these prints have color bars in them and like one of them is actually black and white. It's able to completely ignore that and it's able to find uh, uh, the similar images even with taking that to, into account. It's even able uh, to handle cases like this. So this is a case where this is a two-panel print that was actually put in the wrong order. It was put backwards. Um, and it was able to find it in the correct order at another institution. Um, it was even able to find individual sheets of this multi-panel print uh, at other institutions. So th this way you can, f you can find uh, all, the, all sorts of information. Uh, one, of the things is that one of the nice things about being able to do this image analysis is that once you do this, uh, you're, you're essentially getting back like, a, like a, a matrix saying these two images are the same, and they line up if you skew this one image in this way. And if you do that, 
um, you can actually, and this is something I made uh, using uh, uh, the canvas on, on the client side. So you can take two images and line them up perfectly on top of each other. And what's nice is that then you can use that to cycle through and, and go back and forth and see any differences between the two, uh, the two prints. So one of the things I want to point out with this particular print is if you look at the top, I'll keep going back and forth, look at the top of the print, you can see a large chunk of it has actually been chopped off in one of them. Um, and, and, this, and so this is interesting because this happens pretty frequently. Sometimes the prints are damaged or changed or cut up, and it's hard to determine uh, that. But if you're able to compare these uh, uh, directly on top of each other, it becomes a lot easier. Uh, another thing that I was really interested in, interested in was the ability to be able to search by image. So this is something that I added so that you can actually go to the website, do search by image, you can use your phone if you wish, take a photograph of a print and find that same print at all the different institutions around the world. So this cuts down the time to research from hours if not days down to just seconds. Since you're able to just take a photo now and find the print and find the, all the information about that print wherever, at whatever institution might have it. And additionally, there's uh, uh, also this, this cool, or, or, or there, there, there's an interesting effect here, which is a little bit tricky, I just want to go into. Which is, so you can see this particular print, and there's these large uh, color bars here on this side. And it's able, it was able to find the same print at other institutions. However, it also found the, another print at the same institution, but it's the wrong print. And the reason why it matched is because, it's, in this case, it's actually matching the color bars. It's not matching the print itself. So this is, this is one case where, you know, with some training, and with, uh, you might be able to improve the image recognition technology. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been working on building uh, uh, an application. In this case, it's a mobile application for doing uh, image cropping. So what you can do uh, is, is, you know, in this case on your phone, go load up a bunch of images, go through each one, crop them down to just the print, and remove all this sort of color bar cruft. Now, I, I built this for two reasons. One is I wanted to be able to crop the color bars off, but also I wanted to have something to do on the subway uh, while I was riding around here in New York City, because the thing is that like, you know, I have like all this time, I'm just like 40 minute you know, subway rides all around, so like why not be doing something semi-productive so I can now just sit there and be, and, and you frequently, if you see me on, if you see me on the subway, I'm probably sitting there cropping Japanese woodblock print images um, and listening to like an audio book. So, uh, but it, it's, it's a great use of my time. Um, another thing, so I've been working with, uh, recently with David Chester, he's actually here in New York at Shutterstock, and he's been working on a tool to automatically find and chop off these color bars. Um, surprisingly, there's no open source software that does this at the moment. Uh, but if this is something you're interested in, uh, let me know, and we're, we're just starting to explore this right now. Another thing, another piece of image technology I've been, I've been looking into uh, is this particular one done by uh, Ursat's labs, and this is using what's called uh, deep neural networks. Uh, so this is a case where you actually train it uh, on thousands and thousands of images, and it's able to take the images and start to categorize them. So this is a little bit different because what you're able to do here is you're, actually, you're able to give it, give it a print, in this case, and say which artist made this print simply based upon the style that is being presented here. Um, and, and so this is, it actually seems to work pretty well. It's right, at the moment, it has about 60% accuracy be able to identify the, the artist as the first entry. And so in this particular case, you can see one on the, on the, on the top right up here, uh, there, uh, put in a print. And it was able to correctly identify it as a Hiroshige print. Uh, which is, so this is stuff that's still very, very new, and I think it's potentially very exciting. Um, one of the things I'm very interested in, in as well is the ability to use this technology to start to aid the study of Japanese woodblock prints. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is looking at stuff like this. So this is sort of stuff that the image analysis is really good at detecting. So I just want to flip back and forth between these two prints. Um, can anyone point out some of the things that are different between these two prints? Sorry, say again? Yeah, chin, I heard color. 
patterns. Yep. Yep. So, so all those things are, yes, they are different. The face is different. The colors are different. The little crest on her kimono is different. Um, but it's interesting because the large, almost all of this print is the same. It's just those tiny little things are different. Now, this is starting to get into sort of the uh, uh, mechanics of woodblock printing. Because what happens is, is that in this time, there wasn't really copyright per se, but the way someone owned the rights to produce a print is they owned the physical woodblocks themselves. So what would happen, what actually happened in this case, is one publisher of a woodblock sold the physical woodblocks to another publisher. And that other publisher then uh, 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 took it to a carver and physically chopped out the head of, in this case, the kabuki actor, and stuck in a new piece of wood, carved in the new head, and presto, you have a whole new woodblock depicting some other scene. So in this way, it ends up being, it's a very malleable medium, uh, but this is the sort of thing that image analysis is really, really good at finding, because about 90% of this image is the same, except for these tiny little details that are different. Uh, another interesting one I want to point out is this one. So again, so I'm going to flip back and forth. It is same with the other one. The only thing that's changed is the head here. And so this is, again, this is a kabuki print depicting two different actors. Um, but one thing I want to show here is here down on the right is the signature. Um, you have, there, there, there's Sun Sho and Shun Ko, uh, two different people. Now what's interesting here is that, so you have two different prints depicting two different actors made by two different artists. So, but they're obviously the same thing. You look at them, they're like, this is obviously the same image here and same print. Um, so we're actually, we not, it's not entirely clear what happened here. This is something that was, uh, I just discovered. But this is a case that could only ever be found by using an image analysis. Because the thing is, is that if they're by two, uh, two different actors, and, and, and actually these are two different institutions as well, uh, uh, by two different artists, there is no metadata that agrees. So there's no chance for these images to ever be matched together unless you're doing image analysis. Now the reason why I found this is because of a tool I've been developing. So I've been working with the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, and I've been finding ways of going through and identifying prints in their collection that are either unattributed or possibly misattributed, and finding prints at other institutions that are attributed. So in this case, these are all prints here in red that are at the Met that are unattributed, that, that they, they, did, they don't know who, who produced it. But all, other institutions all have attributions for that particular print. So what is nice is that this speeds up the process of attribution. This speeds up the, the, you know, the, the curator's job at a museum a thousandfold. Because the thing is that the Met has like 4,000 prints. They don't have the time or the ability to go through every single print and find every single one that might be wrong. Whereas now, with this particular tool, they can go through a very short list of you know, dozens of prints that might be wrong, and they can fix them. So one of the things I've been very interested in is in finding ways of correcting the, the misinformation or, uh, attached to prints. Uh, it, 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 it can be very hard to do. So one of the things I want to show here is that there, there are actually many ways in which a name, in, in, in Jap a Japanese name, can be written. This is a very small fragment of all the names uh, this particular artist can be written, uh, Hiroshige. Um, and, excuse me. So one of the problems is that you really want to have a good mapping in between English and Japanese. Because the thing is, is that like, if you have the artist's name written in, in Japanese, you need to be able to correlate that with that same name written in English and vice versa. So one of the things I initially tried to do was like, okay, great, I can just build up a mapping. If I know that every time that Hiroshige is written, then, then uh, it, it correlates to that text, then I'll be good. But the problem is, is that, at least in Japanese, it's not that simple. You can take a single English representation of a piece of Japanese kanji, and it can map to, in, in this case, about nine different writing, different ways of writing the same thing in kanji. Where it's like, okay, well that's a mess. I can't go English to Japanese. But if I have the Japanese word, can I go back to English? And unfortunately, you can't do that either. Um, so like, this, is, this is truly a many-to-many -many mapping, where everything is pointed at everything else many times over. So there's no way to do that simple you know, uh, translation. 
Additionally, there are all sorts of problems with Japanese names in general, and in, especially how they're written here in the West. Um, just to point out a couple wrongs here. So, like, the, the, the thing is, is that the, with Japanese names, it tip, traditionally you would write them a uh, family name first, given name second. But in the West, there's a lot of confusion regarding that. Sometimes you write them one way or the other. Um, they forget to leave off all the important uh, stress marks and the vowels. Um, there's no way to correlate which part of the name correlates to the Japanese portion of the name. And especially, like, even when you have a nicely formatted Japanese name, it's not always clear which part of the name is the surname versus the given name. You don't know where to split it into its two parts. Um, so I've written some node modules to fix all this, uh, which are probably of interest to a very small number of people. Um, but I, I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, 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 one of them was, was a module created by another person that I helped contribute to. is a module called Hepburn, which allows you to take an English name and convert it into a phonetic uh, Japanese alphabet. Uh, another one that I wrote was this one called uh, Enomdict, which uses this really cool Japanese name dictionary and is able to find uh, uh, Japanese names, both in English and Japanese, and figure out if they're a surname or a given name. Um, and additionally, I wrote another library for uh, communicating with the National Diet Library Name Authority, which is sort of the Library of Congress for Japan. And this is sort of their, their definitive database of, of Japanese names. So taking all these together, and putting them into a single module called Romaji name. It's able to take that, that sort of messy situation you ha I showed you earlier and, prevent, and give you back a really nicely formatted JSON object where everything is broken down into the correct given names, surnames, kanjis are properly split, everything is, is stressed correctly. It's like, it, it, it's beautiful. It, it, again, this is from my programmer self where it has to be perfect and nice. So it's taken me like a year to write this. Um, but at least now it's done, and I never have to think about it again. Um, another thing I did is I wrote a library for parsing uh, dates. So museums have very interesting ways of writing dates. Um, and so I took, I, I created this to parse all those really weird ways and turn them into nice date ranges that I can then stick into a database and query. Um, another thing I've been doing is, is merging in all these artists together. So you might have multiple biographies of an artist and, you, and they're all representing the same artist. So what it is, I actually made a tool for going through and finding these, these differences and manually correcting them. So I actually have a little command line tool that I go through, and you're presented with different artists and biographies, and you say which one is the right one, and you merge them together. It, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, again, for a limited definition of cool, but in my opinion, cool. Um, so going back to the, uh, 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 just to close up here, the example I had here at the beginning, so this was, uh, uh, again, the, the, the lot of Japanese prints that were for sale. Um, in this case, I was interested, so I, I went online and I, uh, I, I took one of the images of the prints, uh, I, I put it into my search engine, and it came up with some matches. Um, so it actually came up with the name of the artist, the year in which it was printed, um, and the prints ended up uh, 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 selling for $550. So, I mean, that's not bad. It's like 20 prints uh, um, for about, you know, $30 or so. Um, but what's interesting is that I, I did some research, and these prints individually sell for about $100 to $400. Um, so that means the true estimate for this lot would mean about $2,100 to $8,400. Uh, I should mention I do own these prints now. Um, so, but the thing is, is that in order for them to actually be worth this amount of money, you have to find someone who's willing to buy them. Uh, so you essentially have to become a woodblock dealer in that case, and that's a whole separate thing. Uh, who knows if I'll get into that. At the very least, these are some amazing prints, and I just love them. Um, so I just want to close out here with a really brief note. I wrote about this just recently, a couple weeks ago. So this is my, this is my side project, my hobby project. And I've been working on it now for a, a couple years. And just recently, last fall, I started working on it um, every single day. Because I was finding that I was working on it too intermittently, and I wasn't getting enough work done consistently. Um, so what I did was I made sure that I would work on it at least a little bit every single day. I would write code every day. It would have to be up on GitHub. And so that way, I was constantly making forward momentum. 
And this actually ended up working out really, really well for me. And I've, as you can see, I've, I haven't broken my streak yet. I'm, I'm some, I think about 160 days in or so. Um, so it's, it's, and I've gotten so much work done in the last couple months. It's just completely dwarfed what I've gotten done before. Um, so this is something I just want to recommend because it's, it's actually really changed how I've done, uh, I've been able to balance uh, working on this with my job at Khan Academy and my personal life and all these things. So it, uh, I, just, I just want to bring that up. If you're interested in this, um, the website, the, uh, there's ukiyo.org. I've actually written some uh, academic papers that I've been publishing as well on this particular uh, uh, technology. You can find them up on my website. And all the code for this is up on my uh, uh, GitHub. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be around and I'll be at the party uh, tonight as well. So yeah, thank you.